And talking about Bible reading, I was reading from uh, another book through the Bible uh, book this morning, as well as my Bible. I was talking about Ruth. I was talking about the names of the people involved in the book of Ruth. And Orpah, uh, who went back, you remember, into the pagan land, uh, her name meant stubborn. And I thought, ah. But Ruth was friendship. And uh, You go through the different names of the Bible and look quite often. Uh, it has a, a real significance. So we've looked at Jesus when he said, I am the bread of life. We've looked at the passages, particularly in John chapter 8, when he was the light of the world. And we've looked last week at Jesus saying, I am the gate or I am the door. He was the way into the fold and also he was going in there to get his people, those that knew him. I am the good shepherd is what we're looking at tonight. And the more you look at this subject, the more you read John chapter 10 and the other verses uh, in Old and New Testament, you see the shepherd care of God and the fact that, as we mentioned in our prayers, that those in responsible positions in churches are under shepherds, under the Lord Jesus. They're not in charge. He's in charge. And they are directly responsible to him. And that is a big responsibility if they understand it. Lots of people, oh, I want to be an elder, oh, oh, go around and say I'm an elder, you know, something like that. But there's a responsibility there. And there's, of course, uh, if you go wrong, the Bible says double punishment for you. We should honour those in leadership, but if they go wrong, God comes down very heavily on them because they are the ones that are reaching out to his flock, the people of his kingdom. And the good shepherd wants the best for each one of us. Remember we thought of the fold, the Judaism was like a, a fold where the the shepherds each night would, if they were in a, an area where there was a town, and they went into the municipal pen, they would pop all their uh, animals in there, and somebody was saying earlier that, uh, I think it was John, yeah, talking about calling the sheep out by name, and he's seen that, I haven't actually, but that's what the passage really refers to, that the sheep absolutely know you and they'll follow their shepherd, but they won't follow uh, anybody else. Judaism had 613 laws. Uh, the last check, <laughs> it varies a bit. But that fold was almost like a jail rather than a place of comfort. It was bondage, and Jesus came there to take them out of Judaism into a new covenant, uh, a covenant that we're under at the moment. This new covenant of following the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. The Pharisees, you remember, the scribes, the Sadducees as well, I guess, if you read the passage as we did last week, they were the thieves and the robbers. You think, well, yes, there were literally thieves and robbers that jumped over the the walls and, and nicked the sheep. Sometimes they couldn't get the sheep out, apparently, so they would <coughs> cut their throat, <laughs> throw them over the top, because they were only interested in the meat. The sheep was irrelevant. They wanted the meat, or they wanted the, the wool, the fleece, and that's all they cared about. They didn't care about the individual animal. The good shepherd did. He would lay down his life for his sheep. It's interesting that sheep were led by a good shepherd, but they were driven by a butcher. The butcher, when he came to slaughter, would have to drive the sheep because perhaps they're sharp enough to know that something's going on here that I, I'm not very keen on. 
The Jews were God's sheep. Like us, we, all we like sheep have gone astray. The Jews had, were just like us. Uh, in fact, their, their history really is an example to the, the rest of the world. This is how you would be if you'd been the privileged people. And if we'd have been here in England, the privileged people that had uh, the Lord Jesus come to us, we'd have done exactly the same as they did because we're all sinners and we all need a saviour. So the whole history of Judaism, the history of the Jews, is littered with leaders who failed to be the shepherds of God's flock. And they led people, many of them the kings, would lead their people into gross idolatry. Even wise guys like Solomon started off well, but he was half-hearted, wasn't he, in the end. He married, I don't know how many wives, 700 wives, wasn't it, and 300 cook, I nearly said porcupines, concubines, uh, and he deliberately did something that God said, don't do. He knew Genesis, he knew the basics, and that's what's happening today, isn't it? We, in the Church of Jesus Christ, know what Genesis told us, how it was to be one man and one woman for life. That's what the Bible says, and we know better now. Oh, yes, we're, we're, we're much more in line. Our love can embrace anything, and soon it will, the way things are going. The citizens of Jesus' day were longing for God to send his promise. I told you last week, I think, I was reading, I still am reading through Jeremiah in my um, uh, quiet time. It's not the most wonderful. I'm, uh, I, he was pulled out of the mire of the pit this morning, which was quite exciting. Uh, he was down and, and was pulled up by a man who was obviously uh, a godly believer, Ebed Milek, and he was lifted out of the mire. But in Ezekiel, there was a prophecy that went like this, chapter 20, 34, verse uh, 23, if you want to look it up. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David. Now, this was hundreds of years after David, so it wasn't actually referring to David himself. He'd already passed on. But someone <coughs> like David, because the Jews would recognise, oh, David, he's, he's the best king we ever had. Oh, he was a shepherd king, yes. We, we want more kings like David. And they, sh they needed him too. The way things went downhill from David to Solomon to Rehoboam at all. And then the divided kingdom and so on. And it goes on that he will tend them and he will tend them and be their shepherd. So that's about 400 years afterwards. The prophecy was made. And the, the people were looking for that person to come. We call him today the Messiah. And the, the Jews would be looking for the Messiah. He would be the shepherd king who was going to give them not only uh, what they wanted, but the way to eternal life and safety through our creator in heaven. Jesus called the scribes and the Pharisees, and I suppose the Sadducees as well, who were the aristocracy, ones that had the money, and the position. He called them false prophets and false shepherds. We live in a time when there are false shepherds and false prophets. It's been the same all the way through history and it will continue. And in fact, it will get worse. Jesus said it would towards the end. Uh, and it's getting to the stage now where if you go on the internet, you, <laughs> you can find uh, people that believe in all sorts of things. Uh, it's can be quite helpful, but it can be quite upsetting as well. And it, Jesus said of these false prophets, watch out for false prophets, he said. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. In fact, these people were wolves in sheep's clothing. It doesn't matter what you dress the person up in. You might have a lovely robe, 
and he might have a mitre and a crook and, and a car that carried him around, uh, people that follow him with incense or put a canopy over the top of him, what, whatever. You see it, don't you? No matter what is covering the person, it's what the person actually is that's important, what's in that heart of that person. They could be wolves in sheep's clothing. Jesus claimed in our verses 11 and 14, I am the good shepherd. Remember that Greek term, ego emi. I am the good shepherd. He was saying, I'm God, the one you've been looking for, the shepherd that you've been looking for, the shepherd king. I'm here, right in front of you. And he showed it by the works and the words that he said. But they didn't believe him. David's psalm that we just sung, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's exactly what people want. And there's the old story that I'm sure you've all heard, but maybe one of you hasn't. So a little shepherd boy that was uh, looking after the sheep and he was with them, the sheep all the time. And in the winter time, it got very, very cold. But a, a minister used to go out and talk with this shepherd boy and he would teach him, the Lord is my shepherd. And he would get the boy to hold his finger like that and so that he got it into his mind. The Lord is my shepherd. The boy was illiterate, he couldn't read him himself, but he memorised that. Time went on and the winter really kicked in and sadly the boy died of hypothermia. When they found the boy, they found that he was holding that finger. And people said, why, why is he there holding that finger? And the minister said, well, I know exactly why, because I taught him the Lord is my shepherd. So that lad died in pain, I'm sure, of hypothermia, but he died knowing that the good shepherd was standing by him, was there to take him to heaven. Right in front of these hypocritical shepherds of Jude, Judaism, Jesus was speaking out and showing that he was the true shepherd. They were the people who were slaughtering God's people. They, they were fleecing them, pardon the pun. <laughs> they, they, they were treating them very, very badly and couldn't care less about God's people. Jesus was their expected shepherd king standing right in front of them. And the Bible says uh, that he has one flock and it includes the shepherds that are currently in other sheepfolds. We, in, most of us here, I guess, are Gentiles. We are of another fold and Christ has come for us as well. I had the privilege of going to Papua New Guinea, which is about the far, farthest away I've been from home, and Stone Age people there, literally Stone Age people, with stuff through their nose and wigs on their head and woad and all the rest of it, uh, uh, but, but, but very sharp when you wanted to take a photograph of them. They seemed to understand the money. But they were Stone Age people. Never heard of the Lord Jesus Christ, and there are people prepared to go there. In fact, Tim and his family that we met over there on the Fly River was living on a houseboat and in the river there were crocodiles and he had a family and he was there living on this river on, on the houseboat surrounded by crocodiles and other wild beasts and he was there to translate the scriptures. And we asked him, how long do you think it would take? And he said, oh, probably about 20 years. That's commitment. People all over the world are, are still doing that. They're looking at these people and they're seeing God's sheep, not natives, not people that they can maybe fleece or uh, manipulate. They're looking at people for whom Jesus died, 
but they don't know, they can't understand, they haven't the word of God yet. So I write it down for them. In fact, in Tim's case in Papua New Guinea, the language had never been written. So he had to learn their language, learn how to write it down. He was the one that decided what sounds went with which sign. Uh, the Wycliffe Bible translator was brilliant like that. And then he had to translate the scriptures into their language. Amazing what people will do because they love the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. But the Pharisees certainly didn't do that. They were thieves and robbers. They were the, the hired hands who ran away when the wolf got in. <laughs> they weren't bothered. They weren't going to fight it off. They just ran. Jesus said of those people in Matthew 15, they are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the pit. If we've got blind leaders in the church, in our politics, in whatever we're involved in, then we're in trouble. We need God's wisdom. We need to see things the way God sees. Did they understand what Jesus was saying? Well, verse 6 tells us quite clearly that Jesus used this figure of speech, that the fact that he was the, the good shepherd, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Unbelievable. They're looking for the Messiah King. He's standing in front of them. He's proved who he was. Couldn't get it. Interesting. Jesus could have gone on to say, if I lied, you'd have understood. People will believe lies far more than the truth. Tell people the truth and they back off and, and they're stubborn. They go the other way. Tell them lies and, oh yeah, somebody stands up and says, oh, we all came from a, a multiverse. There are millions, perhaps billions of universes out there and we're just one of them. And people go, oh, yeah, he said that. He, he was a very clever man. No evidence whatsoever backing it up. We'll believe lies just like that. And Jesus gave us the reason why. John chapter 8 says, You belong to your father, the devil, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. You can plead all you like with people telling them the truth. If they're stubborn and they refuse God's truth, there's no hope for them until they repent of their sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said he was the, the shepherd, the good one, if you like, the, the excellent one, the beautiful one, the magnificent one. That's what he's saying. I am the, the good shepherd that gives his life for the sheep. Much better than David, much better than Moses, although they were good leaders of the people in their day. But here is someone who is perfect. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 31 verse 1 says, When a lion attacked the shepherds, uh, they were, the shepherds were sent to deal with it. In other words, the shepherds were the tough guys of those, <coughs> those days. Uh, they had a dirty, rotten job, and it was bottom of the food chain. They didn't get much money for it. But when it came to <laughs> fighting off a lion or, or anything like that, they were the ones that were sent. Remember David, when he went up uh, in front of King Saul and said, I fought off a bear, I fought off a lion with God's help. This, this guy, this uncircumcised Philistine, is going to be exactly the same. And he went in the faith of the Lord because he had fought a good fight in the past. This shepherd would give his life for the sheep. And if sheep lose their shepherd, they often, well, I should imagine most of the time, will scatter and go all over the place. Jesus came and he died. And truly, 
when he died, his disciples did scatter, didn't they? They, they ran from the situation. But soon after the Easter period that we're going to celebrate very shortly, when he rose from the dead, he gathered his people together. There's that lovely verse that 500 plus met him on that mountain in Galilee. There must have been quite a, an occasion. And that wasn't mass hallucination. That was Jesus appearing and 500 plus seeing the Lord Jesus alive from the dead. There are three things that I've noted anyway that a good shepherd provides for his sheep. First thing is protection. They needed protecting thieves, robbers, wild animals, etc., wolves, lions, other predators that were around at the time. We need the protection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we've got to do what God has told us to do with the whole armour of God. If we want the protection that we've got to use, the protection that he's given. And he's given us Ephesians 6. You've obviously heard many sermons on that, I'm sure. We've got to suit up. We've got to put on the whole armour of God. We've got to do our part. God does his part. We've got to do our part. And the second thing is that a good shepherd provides provision for his flock. Green pastures and still waters we were singing about earlier. The sheep only had to eat. We are talking about Bible reading just a few moments ago. If we do not read the scriptures on a regular basis, not the whole thing, not 24 hours... <laughs> A little bit every day. We feed on the word of God. If we do that, we're doing our part. Because God has given us the word of God. And we should feed on it daily. In other words, we need to eat up the word of God. Often in the Old Testament, people are talking about uh, the words of God coming into their innermost being. And that's the way it is. The more you memorise the scriptures, the more you're familiar you get the more it's able to help you and it comes out when you need it. We need to eat it up ravenously, not just ignore it. So many people think that they can live their Christian life without the instruction that the Bible gives. If you've got trouble with your Christian life at the moment, I can guarantee it will be because one, you're not praying, two, you're not reading the scriptures. (laughs) Simple when you're cancelling people who've lost their faith, you say to them, well, what's happened with you? Well, the Bible's boring. And God never answers me anyway, so I don't bother. Okay, you don't bother. And now you're in limbo, you don't, you don't know what you're doing. You need to get back to feeding on the Word of God. You know that a sheep needs feeding. I understand they need watering as well. Is it twice a day or something like that? At least uh, we need feed and liquid to keep ourselves going physically and we need God's provision of the word of God Um, then lastly sheep need a purpose they they need to know that they're to follow that shepherd and go where he wants them to go there's a purpose in them following the shepherd and of course it's their protection as well and guidance and leadership And for the Christian, our purpose is to follow up closely behind Jesus. I mentioned that OM always talk about Christians as Jesus followers. I mean, it's a lovely lovely term, a very biblical term, because Jesus said, follow me, all the way through the New Testament. It's like a drumbeat of discipleship that echoes all the way through. Follow me, follow me, follow me. That's our part. He's leading, we've got to follow. There's something that he does, something that we do. And together as a team, workers together with him, we achieve what God wants us to do. Then I've just got three suggestions to finish with. You can all go, (laughs) he's nearly there. Here it goes. 
Live today with confidence. If you're like me, you lack confidence. Other people seem to gush it all over the place. Uh, but if you've got your eyes fixed upon the Lord Jesus, you can be confident of the way that you're going. Because Jesus stands at the gate of our lives and protects you from the evil one and the false prophets. Uh, we had a period in, in a church near here where there were lots of brown paper parcels being passed with various books on a particular subject. Uh, and those books were passed very sur surreptitiously uh, to young Christians who had recently trusted Christ and it deflected them from following the Lord Jesus. And it's so sad that, that, especially if you had anything in, uh, to do with their conversion by, by sharing the gospel with them and you saw these people, these false shepherds, slipping them things to lead them astray from the word of God. So live with confidence. Then be compassionate. One of the things that came through from this study for me is the love that the shepherd has for his sheep. The love that the Lord Jesus, the good shepherd, has for us believers. He knows what stage we're in. He knows if we've got disease problems and he fixes them if he can and if he chooses to. But he's with us all the time leading and guiding us, we have a compassionate saviour who's prepared to give his life up for us and he wants us to do the same, to share Jesus with other people. Then lastly, the good shepherd loves us so much that he went to the cross to rescue us. If that doesn't show everyone just how much he loves, then nothing does. And of course, even at the time of the trial, you remember, they say, crucify him, crucify him. But afterwards, a great deal of the people that had been there, the, the priests, became Christians, you remember. It's a wonderful thing that afterwards they changed their mind. And then on the day of Pentecost, when the, the gospel was preached by Peter, they said, what shall we do? And he said, repent and believe. And 3,000 did on that one day. And then daily, God was adding to the church after that, adding sheep to his flock. From all sorts of folds, he was drawing them because he's the one that brings people into the kingdom of God. There's a lovely verse in Hebrews that says, now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good thing for doing his will. May he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Lovely, isn't it, that we can have a shepherd, a good shepherd, the most wonderful, magnificent shepherd we can ever have, eternal shepherd, and we can be in his arms all the time. Some of us at the moment maybe are feeling we need to be in the arms of someone holding us to get through what we're going through at the moment. That's why I've chosen this last hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arm. The golden oldie, but what a wonderful truth. And if you're leaning on the arms, of the Good Shepherd, you're in the right place.